Um, so the session is uh, um, uh, officially started. Uh, this is uh, one of the uh, Minamata online session. Minamata online sessions is a, is a series of online sessions convened by the Minamata Convention Secretariat, and uh, it started in 2020, and, and uh, we started the uh, what we call the season two uh, in uh, last year in 2021, uh, which consists of three streams: a science stream, implementation, review and support uh, stream, and uh, the preparation for the conference of the parties. The conference of the parties uh, had its first meeting in, in March, and the science stream uh, uh, will uh, finish at the, uh, uh, with, with the ICMGP International Conference on, on Mercury as a Global Pollutant Session in July. So we are preparing uh, for, for season three. This is uh, the, the the second to last session under the uh, Minamata uh, Online season two. Uh, we convene the science stream in, in co cooperation with the uh, ICMGP, which meets on the 24th and to 29th of July 2022. So I think uh, uh, this this is it. I, I just just I wanted to, to say about what Minamata Online is, and I, I hand it over to my colleague Manuela. Over to you. Thank you, Isaku. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, I hope that everyone is well. Um, let me say a few words about the last meeting of the COP. It was held in March, as Isako mentioned, but there was something uh, very special, at least to me, at the COP, that the, the parties decided to, to make the, the, link, the, the linkages between the Mercury work under the Minamata Convention, the Biodiversity and Larger Sustainable Development Goals, even stronger. So there is the COP took a decision that it requested the Secretariat to develop uh, a report with recommendations on how the Minamata Convention can contribute to the post 2020 biodiversity framework, the global biodiversity framework. And it also urged countries to, in, to engage indigenous peoples, local communities and other stakeholders on the development and implementation of national action plans in the context of uh, artisanal and small-scale gold mining. It also requested the Secretariat to prepare uh, uh, a study compiling views on the needs and priorities of indigenous peoples with regards to mercury. So there are all these uh, connected decisions that are bringing the mercury work to larger sustainable development goals. And this is what we are doing today is this uh, Minamata online webinar is part of a uh, series of initiatives to link uh, the Minamata work to larger sustainable development goals, including biodiversity, conservation, sustainable use. So today we have uh, four presentations. We we'll have Eva Krummel from the Inuit Circumpolar Council. We'll have David Evers from the Biodiversity Research Institute, Jaime Esqueveria from EAE Consult in Costa Rica, and myself, I'm with the Secretariat, Manuela Miranda. Um, without further ado, let me just jump into the housekeeping notes. Um, I will share my screen quickly here. I hope you can see it on the screen. You can test your audio uh, and adjust your speak and microphone settings by opening the audio and video menu at the top left corner of your screen. You can also open the participants panel and the channel pa chat panel by clicking the respective icon at the bottom right corner of your screen. You can see it here on the screen how it looks. Um, if you wish to type a question in the chat box, please address it to everyone. However, if you need technical assistance, you can send it to the host. You can also use the chat, but address your message to the host. Um, as Isako mentioned, this uh, session will be recorded and it will be broadcasted. Thank you very much. And I will now um, stop sharing and uh, invite Eva to present. Please, Eva. Thank you very much, Marina. 
Um, so I'm going to start sharing my screen to start my presentation. Just a second. And put that in presenter mode. So I hope you can all see that. Okay. So, yeah, I'm going to talk about how Inuit are affected by mercury in the Arctic. Thank you very much um, for inviting me um, to talk to you and talk about this. Um, I'm working um, for the Inuit Circumpolar Council and have been representing um, ICC um, with the abbreviation um, in the mercury um, work, including the Minimada Convention and also the negotiations of the Minimada Convention. And starting with that, um, during the um, negotiation, um, um, there was um, the um, need to highlight the particular vulnerabilities of Arctic ecosystems and indigenous communities. Um, and that was because of um, biomagnification of mercury and contamination of the traditional foods. And I'm going to be um, talking a little bit more about this and uh, how Inuit particularly are affected by mercury contamination. When we talk about the Arctic, um, this map shows you what um, what I mean. This is Inuit Nunat, um, the Inuit homeland. And Inuit live in Chukotka in Russia, in Alaska, in the United States, in Canada and in Greenland. And the organization that I work for, Inuit Circumpolar Council, um, has offices in all of those countries. And the office that I work for is located in Ottawa, in Canada, in the capital. Why mercury matters in the Arctic is um, probably everybody knows that this, this who is part of this talk. Um, it undergoes long range transport. There are very few sources in the Arctic itself. Um, we do see biomagnification and marine food web, particularly in metal mercury. I'm sure that David is going to talk about this and probably in Jaime also. Um, and that is a problem for Inuit because um, we have subsistence consumption of marine foods and particularly marine mammals, which tend to be very, very high in mercury and exceeding guidelines. Um, here, the graph on the right shows uh, some of the exceedances in polar bears and in humans, and particularly also in Inuit. And that obviously is a very big concern with regards to the ecosystem and also human health effects. During the negotiations, one thing that we pointed out, um, we have been working as part of the Arctic Monitoring and Assessment Program on um, mercury assessments, um, talking about how mercury is um, in the Arctic, what the levels are, etc. And this graph shows you how mercury concentrations have increased um, in Bayula since um, um, humans have been um, undertaking industrial activities. And um, so this just shows us that we need to um, work globally to um, reduce mercury releases in the environment so that uh, we return to uh, background levels. We also have presented um, this graph here. This shows you mercury exceedances in Inuit women across the Arctic in particular. And you see that um, particularly in Greenland, we had very high um, exceedances of women um, up to 97% uh, um, of, of the Inuit women um, um, were exceeding the guidelines. So um, that has been of, um, obviously a very great concern. Um, this is a slide that I have brought from my colleague Melanie Lemire, who works with Inuit in the um, Canadian Arctic in Quebec. And um, she has been summarizing, they have been undertaking um, Inuit health surveys and um, talk, um, looked at um, human health impacts and um, here she summarized some of them and um, you see that um, it has um, impacts with regards to uh, pregnancy um, but then also later in life um, impacts on memory, intellectual performance, language, um, attention problems, etc. fine motor functions, decreased heart rate variability, elevated blood pressure, etc. So there are several health effects that can be measured. Um, more recently, we have been working with um, in AMAP um, on the human health assessment in the Arctic, like an update, um, which is um, available on the AMAP website now. It's a preprint version. Um, and then there's also um, Lil Basu, um, and a few of us have been summarizing some of this work for the Mercury assessment, and it's also being published in Stoughton. 
which is um, available already. Just a few highlights from that paper. Um, we have been summarizing that um, the Minimada Convention obviously has been influenced by the health concerns raised, particularly in Arctic populations and Inuit, because Inuit are very highly exposed, although there are no really sources um, in the Arctic. And um, the exposure is high enough to cons um, with regards to impact health. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the risk communication because it's a very important aspect of it. And then um, we also covered a little bit, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this, um, how um, the monitoring of mercury in the Arctic is important for the Minimada Convention um, effectiveness evaluation. This is an example from the Fur Islands, which is um, we put in the human health assess AMAP human health assessment from 2015, but it's also in the Stoughton paper that I just mentioned. Um, the upper graph shows um, human hair concentrations in the furs, and um, you see also pilot whale concentrations of um, mercury. And uh, as you can see, the pilot whale um, has been going up, uh, human hair has been going down, and that is mostly because of the risk communication that um, the um, public public health um, officials did in the Fur Islands, and they have been doing that very successfully. Um, it's an um, interesting situation in the Fur Islands um, because the pilot whales are the main source of contaminants, and um, they have lots of other things available to them, so it has been relatively easy um, but there have been cultural um, impacts, obviously, because it's part of their culture. So I'm just um, basically summarizing here some of the um, the risk communication that has been undertaken. And the most recent is in 2008, where they basically said no more pilot whale consumption is recommended at all. And um, this obviously is um, very drastic. But um, in the Fur Islands, they basically say do not eat pilot whale at all. That is not really possible for Inuit. Um, as you may know, Inuit uh, have um, live in, in a place where it's very cold in the winter, and the traditional foods keep people warm. It's um, I'm just summarizing here some of the um, the benefits that are associated with the traditional diet. There are cultural benefits, nutritional benefits. The traditional diet includes all the healthy fatty acids, nutrients, minerals, everything that Inuit need. Um, social benefits, because um, in you share their food, it's very, very important to get together and share meals. And um, the economic benefits, because imported foods need to be shipped up. It's super expensive, and uh, some of the prices that you see here are actually substituted prices, because the Canadian government is kind of substituting so that um, it's affordable at all. But that's still very expensive, and if you consider the very cold climate, Inuit are not really able to keep warm with the salad or um, even by eating food. So while there are um, obviously vitamins, etc., in, in the imported foods, um, they are definitely um, very expensive. And um, if it's too expensive and um, it's not really affordable, then um, people might switch to things like um, pops, um, which means um, sugar drinks and um, cheap um, junk foods, and um, that then has other health effects, such as um, heart disease, diabetes, etc. So it's not really an option. And um, so the communication of, of mercury in traditional foods um, is really problematic, um, partly because some of the messages that um, have been put out, things like, you know, what you see here, how brain damaging mercury puts Arctic kids at risk, um, is being communicated um, in one part of the globe, and then it reaches Inuit at home for here, the example in, in Luke, and um, and they get really scared and um, possibly stop eating their diet, which is still the most important food for them and the most healthy. So some of the difficulties we have been seeing with risk communication, it has been leading to fear and confusion. Um, some sometimes, and particularly early stages, people have been switching to other foods, um, which were even, um, which were much worse, worse um, such as um, sugary drinks and chips and junk food. Um, and it has an impact on the society, the economy and the health of the people. Um, 
then it's very difficult if you do risk communication you really have to make sure that um, you reach the target audience and that people have understood and received the message and, and have received them in the right way and um, that is rarely done and um, very very difficult to do in and particularly on circumstances it's also possible that people just simply cannot comply um, if there is food insecurity and there is food insecurity in the arctic often very high because people do not necessarily have um, have the funds to, to buy foods, the money to do so. So you have high uh, food insecurity. And then if, if there is the um, possibility that people can hunt beluga, which again is a very, very important cultural activity, people will do um, hunt the, the beluga and will obviously eat them because it is, as I mentioned, healthy food. Um, so overall, um, it's it's very important for the well-being and um, the cultural importance of the traditional country foods is, is just huge. So people need to be able to eat it. Um, when we come to health messaging in, in Canada, Canada particularly, um, but also other parts of the, Canada, uh, of the Arctic, um, the health officials usually highlight the importance of the traditional diet, the country foods, that it's a good source of healthy fats that it's um, important and for pregnant women. And um, people generally understand and hear that message um, because it also is something that they feel. I mean, they have been, it's part of their culture, culture as I mentioned. Um, in Nunavik, we also um, had a health advisory that pregnant women should reduce the amount of beluga meat they eat because of mercury in it. Um, but only um, a smaller percentage of people really get that message. And so that's another problem um, if, you know, you need to be aware that it often if even if there is such messaging out there, it's um, sometimes people simply um, don't don't hear it. Now I'm going to switch a little bit um, about the importance how mercury research is being done and in the Arctic. Um, we have um, very good programs such as the Northern Contaminants Program in a, of the Canadian government, which is done in partnership with the Indigenous peoples. Um, including Inuit, and um, where we really try to, um, to bring together indigenous knowledge and science um, to inform the mercury research, um, which leads to better policy development and management um, in the Arctic. Um, the Arctic indigenous peoples are rights holders. They have uh, land claim agreements. They have the right to manage their or co-manage their resources, etc. So. Um, it's important that all the, the research is done um, together with them or by them. And um, this then also can provide input into the Minimada Convention, for example, which then hopefully would lead to the decreasing mercury levels that um, I hope that um, we will be able to show in the future. Um, the latest AMAP mercury assessment is currently um, in development, and um, I've been working with Maggie Oud from Environment and Climate Change Canada and 34 co-authors on a chapter where we summarize um, what are Indigenous people's contributions and perspectives to the study of mercury in the Arctic. And we also have um, put it together for a Stoughton paper, which is going to be published very soon, probably next week. It's currently in press. And we have been um, basically um, showcasing over 40 mercury projects um, across the Arctic, as you can see here. A lot of them are in Canada because we have been um, having a lot of co-authors who are um, funded also by the Northern Contaminants Program, um, and a lot of the community-based monitoring is done, therefore, in Canada. And um, those projects are very um, unique in the way that they, they do involve Indigenous peoples um, as partners. Often they lead or co-lead the projects and are involved in the design, the sampling, the data analysis, and the communication. And those can um, include all kinds of um, biota, sediments, water. <clears throat> it really depends on what the concerns are. Um, some of the examples that we then included with regards to indigenous knowledge, um, which have been informing the uh, studies there. For example, um, we have been um, showing that indigenous knowledge explained lower mercury levels due to fish migration, or um, they have been um, providing input on feeding behavior of caribou um, with regards to mercury changes 
Um, then also indigenous knowledge on fish types and appearance and habitat or feeding ecology, which were found to cause different mercury levels. Um, there were concerns about fish health, which were, was leading to a containment study and then later to consumption advisories for lakes. And some very interesting um, finding that um, some of the um, Inuit women in Nunavik had a lot of um, selenium, a very protective selenium um, component, um, and higher than um, the males. And um, then Inuit have been informing the researchers that that is because in, um, women eat a particular part of the beluga tail, which is high iron and that uh, selenium compound. This slide I also got from Le Melanie Lemire. Um, it shows um, mercury levels in three. Um, Inuit uh, populations from Nunavik in Quebec. And as you can see, um, it's important when you sample. And um, for the Hudson Strait Inuit, they um, they do hunt beluga in the summer, and you can see how the mercury values get um, pretty high during that time. So therefore, it's really important to um, to partner with the Inuit and, um, and hear about when you should take the samples, because they will be able to tell you that's when they have the highest exposure, likely because that's when they eat the beluga. Um, and or you know whatever other sources of um, of food that might be important in that aspect, whereas in in the winter months um, they would not as eat as much and um, therefore they would have lower levels. So we also included some recommendations with regards to um, the mercury research how it's being done in the Arctic that it really should be based on a collaborative process and partnerships. Um, it should have equitable engagement of indigenous peoples, and it really um, causes um, great monitoring studies um, that have been extremely successful also in COVID times when other people couldn't be sampling or couldn't do their study. If you work with the communities in the Arctic, um, it's not a problem because they are living there. Um, for the Stoughton paper, um, we also found that we found a lot of the, um, the community-based or community-driven monitoring studies in Canada because of the sustained funding. And it really um, results in a holistic approach to understanding work in the Arctic. So it's um, a great examples. So overall, um, as I mentioned, Inuit are adversely affected by mercury in the Arctic. Um, health effects have been measured, so it's a concern. There are also cultural impacts due to mercury. And um, there's really the importance to um, to conduct um, the um, research in the Arctic in an equitable and ethical way. And ICC has recently completed the Circumpolar Inuit Protocols for equitable and ethical engagement. And anybody or everybody who wants to do research in the Arctic should really read them. You can get them on ICC's website, which is shown here. And then if you're interested in the EMAP assessments, you can go on the EMAP website and download them there for free. So I think that's for me. And if you have any questions, um, I can answer them, I hope. Thank you very much, Eva. Very interesting and very relevant uh, research and work. Um, it, does anyone have any questions? Please type it in the chat. In the meantime, Eva, I actually do have quite a few questions, but I will limit myself. Uh, I, if that's okay, can I ask you, if the if you are aware of any studies or research that uh, checks the changes in health status due to the change in diet, has there been anything from the government or from ICC or anyone else among the Inuit populations because of the ch the shift in diet that you mentioned? You mentioned as a risk, but I'm not sure to what extent it's being monitored. Yeah, they they are. Um, I mean. Yeah, they are always looking um, at um, the effects and um, the studies are going on like all the time, basically. So I'm sure that um, they will have updates. There's also in Canada, they are doing the Inuit health survey. Um, it's not just because of mercury. I mean, you know, they're also looking at other contaminants and um, and Inuit um, got uh, quite a bit of, of funding nationally for um, doing an Inuit health survey and there will be but they will be focusing on a holistic approach. So they will be looking at all kinds of factors. And um, 
yeah, and it, it will definitely include um, the overall t uh, transition to other foods, um, what effects that is, but usually what you do see is um, higher diabetes, higher um, overweight and things like that. And um, so you, you do get health effects from shifting to, um, you know, basically to a store-bought diet, which is often not as healthy as the, um, the country foods. Yes, I th uh, my experience is also that we see the, a similar shift in many of these small island developing states because of the globalization, the access to processed food and an abandonment of the traditional foods. Thanks. Um, do we have any more questions? If not, Eva, I would like to thank you very, very much for this very important work. We look forward to the continuation and future um, outcomes. Thank you. Thank you, Manuela. Thanks, everybody. I'll be leaving pretty soon, so but uh, keep keep. I'll be here for another few minutes. Thanks, Eva. And now I would like to invite David, who will be talking, David Evers from the Biodiversity Research Institute. He'll be talking about the adverse impacts from global environmental mercury loads on fish and wildlife populations and ultimately biodiversity. Uh, David is the chief scientist and founder of uh, the Biodiversity Research Institute, and he oversees several ongoing mercury monitoring efforts. He's also involved with several processes under the Minamata Convention, the most recent being uh, he led uh, the authorship, the, the writing, the drafting of the chapter on biota monitoring of the guidance that was uh, 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 recently considered at COP for supporting the effectiveness evaluation of the convention. David, please, the floor is yours. Very good. Thank you, Manuela. Um, it's good to be here. And um, the topic I'll talk about today is the, the nexus or the interaction of mercury and biological diversity. And I'll have to say just from the out outset that um, there are no scientific papers necessarily that model the impacts of mercury on biodiversity as a whole. Um, so it's a tough topic, it's a challenging topic to, to uh, look at, but there are ways to approach this, this sort of question. Um, what are the global impacts of mercury? Uh, not just organisms, not just the populations or species with biodiversity. So it's a, it is a challenging uh, topic to, to look at. There's uh, several key relationships to consider when I kind of start to break this down. Um, the, the important part of understanding mercury in the environment, in the global environment, is understanding um, where are the places that um, are most sensitive, so ecosystem sensitivity, we'll discuss a little bit. Also, different organisms respond differently to mercury in the, in the ecosystem. So methylmercury is, is an important um, aspect of the mercury issue. And methylmercury can biomagnify through the food web. It can bioaccumulate over time in an organism. So bio, biotectrophic level is another very important uh, component to understand. And then biodiversity itself. Where are those, those hot spots of biodiversity? So when I kind of think of this and break it down and have mercury in this orange arrow, sort of the, the stressor that's coming into the system, I think if we want to look at where are those worst case scenarios in the world, we need to look at areas that have high ecosystem sensitivity, we'll describe that soon, high biological diversity, and then what are those species of greatest concern? Those are the species that have high trophic level, and they can be aquatic or terrestrial organisms. And then lastly, the, again, the worst case scenarios are to examine which of those species are IUCN red listed species. So if we break this down a little bit, what are trophic levels? Trophic levels just uh, represent the, uh, the food web and how organisms relate to one another in a food web. Um, oftentimes, um, I look at from a mercury monitoring standpoint at tertiary consumers. So these are predators that are high up in the trophic food chain. It typically are the species that maybe that are, are of interest from a human health standpoint but they're also obviously of interest from, a, from an ecosystem or eco health standpoint. And, um, but this is the sort of food web or trophic level exchange that's very important to examine. For example, 
if um, we wanted to choose um, a food web trophic level of three, then that would not give us these sort of worst case scenarios that, that I'm trying to understand as, as we go through this process. And then we think of ecosystem sensitivity. These are global models that we're generating right now at BRI to better understand globally where are those places that are most sensitive to mercury input and where methylation can happen thereafter. So it's that interaction of mercury and methylation in the environment. Methylation is, is, is the result of sulfur reducing bacteria, iron reducing bacteria, creating a, a methylmercury waste. There's many factors that are put into these models. I'm not going to go into them in detail, but you can see the seven different variables that we use on the right-hand side here that represent landscape variables, soil, water, um, quality, um, et cetera. So when I think of that ecosystem sensitivity and also what is the, uh, the input of mercury in, in globally? So we have these sort of models that we can generate now because of a lot of different uh, data from uh, just the mercury inventory through the minimum initial assessment process. Uh, there's other sources of mercury emissions uh, that we gathered as well. So the first four uh, variables on the right represent different sources of mercury. And then again, there's anthropogenic sort of influences of how that mercury can be distributed or redistributed in these systems. Um, again, this is a model that, that we've generated to understand what is the risk around the world. And I'm gonna go into this geographically when I start to look at threat. So the way of looking at this is the threat equals sensitivity plus the risk of mercury. So sensitivity to the ecosystem plus the risk of, of mercury in that system. And the, this is the sort of map that we can start to see the orange, I should say the orange and red areas are the areas that have high threat. Okay, and then the green and blue areas have lower threat. Yeah, remember threat is the combination of ecosystem sensitivity and risk. Um, I just highlighted four areas that, that we're studying in with colleagues, many different colleagues um, in these three areas, primarily because these are some of the areas that are, have high threat of methylmercury to organisms. And they include the Caribbean region, that region is being supported by a SIP project. Uh, there's Upper Amazonia, many different uh, researchers and colleagues that are working in that area. Um, Central Africa is a new area of concern. Uh, in the past, there's been few data points from the African continent. A lot of those data points show lower mercury, but we've identified through this threat model that there are areas in Africa that uh, actually do support extremely high levels of mercury in biota such as fish. And then there's the Indo-Pacific area um, with a focus in, on, in, in Indonesia um, because of the high risk of mercury in that system and also ecosystem sensitivity. These are not the only four areas where there's a, a significant threat of methylmercury to biota, but there are four areas that are being studied. Another way of, of looking at this then, when we think of those three mapped models of sensitivity, risk, and threat, um, we can start to see on the right-hand side in Indonesia, uh, and on the far right, we can see the global mean. And then there's eight countries that we have focused on on our end simply because they, they happen to be study areas. If we look at Indonesia, Indonesia shows that it has high sensitivity, high risk because of the mercury input, and then that ends up with a high threat. If you can see the letters at the top of each of these graphs, they just represent significant differences. So Indonesia is significantly higher than Brazil as a threat, higher than Colombia as a threat. Um, and then I have identified Gabon. Um, I'll show some more data for Gabon later, but Gabon is interesting where it's high sensitivity, low risk of mercury input, almost at the global mean, but has a high threat. Not a lot of mercury coming in the system, but the system ends up being very sensitive. So that, that's the value of the models is starting to identify uh, within a country or within a region, where are the areas that we need to worry about the most and, and where are those threats? And even by country, um, it varies considerably, which I'll show you here soon. So when we think of um, that, that Venn diagram I had, there's, uh, there's the trophic level exchange, it's very important. Uh, the ecosystem sensitivity, 
is extremely important as well. But then we want to look at that that um, that combination, that nexus, and how that relates to biodiversity. So biodiversity can be related in many different ways. We can look at it as key biological biodiversity areas, key KBAs, is one way of doing this, and uh, approach to understand how KBAs may overlap with areas that are highly sensitive to mercury is to look at Ramsar sites. Another convention, Rams, the Ramsar Convention identifies wetlands of significant uh, importance around the world. Uh, so this is a map of the different Ramsar sites and wetland areas around the world. If you use that as a proxy for ecosystem sensitivity, which is a decent one, but it's not perfect, then we can kind of wave our arms around and kind of have an idea in these three areas that I've identified again, that where are the KBAs that overlap with uh, Ramsar wetland areas? And in those Ramsar wetland areas, we're assuming this ecosystem sensitivity is, is in place. So a lot of areas that northern part of South America, parts of Africa, and parts of in the Indo-Pacific. This is one approach that we're using or looking at, I think it's a rough one. We're fine tuning it as we go along, but another way of looking at this is by species richness and using these heat maps. So this is all species, um, birds, mammals, uh, amphibians, reptiles, fish. And so these are all the vertebrate species um, around the world and in, in the species richness are the areas that we all know very well. Uh, South America, parts of Africa, and then parts of Asia. And if we use these heat maps and link it with the mercury threat maps that we have, and we don't right now have a, a, a weighting sort of factor, so we just weight it one to one ratio, this, these are sort of maps that we start to identify from our bird. If you look at the upper left, there's the bird species richness map. Bird species richness relates to bird biodiversity. And if you look at, so if you look at bird biodiversity and the threat maps that we generated, you bring those together, the uh, orange areas end up being areas that have high mercury or modeled as high mercury or methylmercury in the ecosystem and then high species richness. So the species richness can be broken down obviously into different classes of, of organisms, birds, mammals, amphibians. We can even look at endemic species by freshwater ecoregion. This is a question that we've worked on with the Nature Conservancy, for example. So these are these approaches start to give us a little bit idea how what is that nexus of mercury and biodiversity. Again, very challenging uh, sort of question to uh, to um, actually um, to, to look at. But if we really start to dig in on, let's say, at a country level, I think this is a good example. If you recall, uh, for Africa. The threat level for Africa, if I go back here, was this mix of orange and green. Um, and again, this is an area that hasn't been identified as a problem area before. But when you really, really zoom in with a model and we actually um, bring in other data layers to have a more specified uh, examination or assessment of the country, we can see that there's a lot of um, uh, differences within a country in the aspects of, of the uh, threat of mercury. So the threat of mercury, if you look at this key here, low is blue and green, high is red and orange. So the threat of mercury, and remember threat is ecosystem sensitivity and input of, of mercury. This northern part of Gabon has some of the highest threats. So that, that area where there's the highest threat, are there rams or wetland areas in there? There actually aren't, which is interesting. But if we look at the key biodiversity areas, the KBAs, see there's KBAs actually right in the middle of that area. So that area that I've circled would be an area that I would examine first. I'm actually collecting data, understanding the, the organisms in that area that could be surrogates for understanding the threat of mercury to biodiversity. So these are, this is probably a better, more quantitative way of looking at that question. So the question then starts to become in my mind, okay, where, where are all the data that we have? Uh, there was a question earlier in the chat, uh, where do we have fish mercury data uh, pulled together globally? So we actually do the greater we, um, working through the fate and transfer partnership areas for the global mercury partnership um, over the past seven or eight years. Uh, data have been gathered um, from, for over a thousand species 
uh, they num from peer-reviewed literature. It numbers over a million numbers to date that are published. And then the question is not just exposure, but how do the effect levels, effect thresholds relate to the ex mercury exposure? So all, all biota have some sort of mercury in their bodies um, now in the past. But how much mercury is in their bodies is what is, is really important, those thresholds, those adverse thresholds. And those adverse thresholds are something that um, actually requires a lot of different studies to understand them well. But in the end, the effect thresholds uh, for relevant outcomes, relevant outcomes are those that are scalable, such as based on reproductive uh, performance. They're well known for fish, birds, and mammals. Um, but they do differ by taxonomic group, by, by class for sure, class of fish, class birds, class mammals, but also by order. So within birds, there's different orders of birds that react differently to mercury. And foraging guild also ends up being uh, quite important as well. So the data that have been compiled to, to date, uh, they represent um, over 1,400 peer-reviewed publications. Um, right here, what you see right now are the reds, the yellows, the oranges. These are all, these represent 3,600 uh, sampling locations. And they represent um, over 640,000 samples. There's another 400,000 or so samples that are just represented by freshwater fish data that we also have uh, for the U.S., Canada, and Europe. There are just too many to, to put on this map. But that, those are the data that have been compiled over the past eight years to date. It's a fairly comprehensive database, um, for the, especially for the organisms that are of greatest concern, so those high trophic level species. So much is known, and with these sort of data, we can, we can then, um, as scientists, look at what are those species, those high trophic level organisms. We can pull that out of that database, which we call the Global Biotic Mercury Synthesis, or GBIMS. Those, those GBIMS data serve as a, as a platform to use as um, a way to, to um, look at the data that exists, find the high trophic level organisms that can give us where are those worst case scenarios. And then we can start to understand from a fish, bird, or mammal, or other organism standpoint, what are those best indicators by the different biomes on the left side here from the Arctic, boreal forest, temperate broadly from tropical rainforest, and the associated waters with those systems. You can see, and I'm not going to go through this, but we can see in this matrix that there's certain organisms that start to stand out as not only as good indicators for monitoring mercury in these systems, but they're also good indicators or surrogates, possibly, for species that have greatest conservation concern, i.e. the IUCN red list of species. So when we think of the exposure data, effects data that would, would go into understanding what are, how much mercury is too much for an organism, we can start to look at a landscape like this landscape, let's say in a tropical area, and start to pick apart in this landscape which organisms we'd want to use as indicators for this landscape, because different organisms are found in different areas. Sharks are in marine systems. Uh, river otter may be up in the river, river up in the river systems themselves. Uh, there's terrestrial sort of uh, species that we may want to look at too, because there's this terrestrial component from aquatic systems that can be uh, of, of interest. So it gets complicated. It's very complex. And when I think of it globally, of all the data out there and all the different species, but it can be broken down. It can be broken down um, just in the way that I described here. In my last slide. Um, I was thinking through how best to, to quantify this response of mercury um, to biodiversity. And I, and I think this is an eight step or so approach. Um, the first step is just, is just pulling together all the mercury data that, that are known, published, and they could be in, in gray literature too, of especially of high trophic level organisms at a global level. So that, that's partially been conducted. And then once we have that, that exposure data, there, now there needs to be a way to explain how much mercury is too much. And those effect thresholds are fairly well known through peer review publications and there's synthesis papers that are brought together how much mercury is too much and how does that mercury result in some sort of injury in the end. So number three is using mercury effect thresholds that are scalable. And scalable meaning that the, uh, the actual impact 
can be scaled from a, from a time or spatial standpoint. And reproduction or survival are two scalable uh, endpoints of effect levels. Uh, behavior and physiological impacts, which are also usually looked at, those are very important, but they're not as scalable. And there's, there's efforts in the U.S. to actually uh, conduct what are called injury assessments through a very formal U.S. regulatory uh, approach called the Natural Resource Damage Assessment and Restoration, or NERDAR. And through uh, NERDA or NERDAR sort of uh, approaches in the U.S. for the past 30 years, this sort of uh, scalability and identifying the injury and assessing that injury and then um, scaling that injury across space and time is, is something that the U.S. does have great experience and background in. So one through three is something that can be done. Number four is just generating population models of adverse impacts. As we go through this, the, these numbers, it gets harder and harder. There's less and less scientific material, but, but there is a path forward. By looking at population models, there's many different population models of the different species, but relating that to adverse impacts of mercury starts to get a little bit more challenging. Number five is we can identify areas of high biodiversity and, and ecosystem sensitivity. We're doing that right now with models. So once we have those areas of, of, of interest with the population models behind us of impacts, we can run those sort of models, number six, um, with mercury impacts for these key areas of the species of greatest concern. Remember that, that, that area, the, basically the, the, uh, the areas that we worry about the most. What are those species in, in the worst case scenarios? That's what I'm gonna get at. And then number seven is quantifying the injury of mercury at a population level for those areas. And the last one, is we can finally determine the percent species loss in those key biological hotspots. So that would be, um, this is fairly new. I'd be very interested in hearing any sort of feedback now or in the future of, of, of this sort of uh, thought process of how do we look at mercury in the global ecosystem? What is that nexus with biodiversity? And how do we look at the impacts of mercury from a biodiversity standpoint? So that's all I have, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. David, excellent. Thank you so much. I'm impressed by the amount of work that goes into this. Um, let me see if we have any questions. Um, we seem to have some. Let me see here. We have... Um, a question from Dominique Valley. Thanks, David, for your, the presentation. In case of Northern Gabon, where wetlands are seen as sensitive areas where the model shows an increase of mercury in birds, can we consider these areas as the outlet for contamination coming from neighboring countries or the fact that the time of the sampling observations, the birds sampled are the ones in transition as part of their natural migration? Thanks, Dominique. Ah, yes. Good question, Dominique. Um, if um, so, one approach to look at or examine or assess um, mercury exposure and biota within certain geographic areas is to, to make those proper choices and have the proper matrices too. So in the area in this, in this instance for the area in Northern Gabon, um, I would examine that area through multiple different um, organisms. So from fish to birds or even, even mammals. If I did use birds, I would worry about migra the migratory component, and there's a very easy way to get around that migratory component is using blood as a matrix to identify the exposure levels for that specific area. Blood shows dietary uptake of methylmercury in, in the past few days or up to a week. So it's, it's a, there are different ways of looking at these organisms and having them really reflect specific areas. Thanks, David. Very interesting. I have also a question here from Jaime. He's asking whether the U.S. regulatory models are based on monetary calculations. Yeah, so um, I mentioned, uh, and I could go into this a lot more, a whole uh, presentation about the nat uh, natural resource damage assessment uh, regulations that the U.S. uses. The, um, the injury assessment that is conducted based on the gathering of mercury exposure relating that exposure to effects and relating those effects at how many individual um, bird years were lost. For example, as a metric, it could be fish years or some other organism or level of organism that is examined. And then there is an economic component to that 
Um, the, the next question is, once there's an injury assessment set up, how much money would it cost to recover that injury from that has been identified? That's the economic part that can be used. And if I use oil spill as maybe a better example or easier one to first all visualize, if 10,000 brown pelican years were lost from an oil spill, how much money would it cost to bring 10,000 brown pelican lives back? So that's the economic part that is used at a very formal level in the US. Thanks, David. There's another question from Kevin Bishop. Why is the focus on biodiversity rather than biota? Wouldn't it be better to find species most at risk, whether or not they are in areas of high biodiversity? I think the Arctic will lose out if biodiversity is a criteria. Yes, thanks for that question, Kevin. Um, I, I agree. I think all the above. Um, I think the point here with this presentation is how do we really link up uh, mercury in the global environment with biodiversity it is, as I mentioned, is not an easy sort of task. It's very challenging. And it's it's one that hasn't really been conducted yet. I think using um, you know examining the impacts of mercury um, around the world um, and using certain specific organisms to answer the questions that we have. So there will be different questions in different places around the world. And if we look at this threat assessment model, um, the Arctic is, is mostly green here in our threat assessment model. But I know there's a lot of areas, and Eva was able to showcase that there's some upper trophic global organisms like pilot whales that are in these systems that do deliver a lot of mercury at a, at a level that has a threat to human health. And, and mercury in the Arctic also has a threat to, to Arctic uh, organisms. So there's an ecological health threat and a human health threat still in these areas that are green. So you can imagine the areas that are in green, how they compare to the areas in orange or red. There's even a greater threat in those areas. But I would say there's threats around the world and it's up to us as scientists and as detectives to understand where are those threats and what organisms are being impacted. Thanks, David. One last question for you before we move on. And this is from Li Fei Zhang how to separate the influence of mercury and other pollutants um, when building the threat map? Well, this is a threat map that's only related to mercury. It's not related to other contaminants. I, I could see a model that does include other contaminants. I think that's the question. And there is a, there's a synergy with mercury and some contaminants like PCBs. It's not just additive, there's a synergy where the combination of PCBs and mercury cause even more harm to an organism than, than those contaminants alone are added up. So looking at contaminants and anthropogenic chemicals or just chemicals, for example, it's even uh, more challenging to look at from a biodiversity standpoint. Mercury is hard enough, um, but I think that's the challenge in front of us all. That's not going away. And that, that sort of challenge is right in front of us right now, and we need to take it head on. That's very true, David. I think more and more with climate change, other novel entities of chemicals, um, this is the complexity is only increasing, and we need to find ways to deal with it. Uh, David, thank you very much. There are other questions in the chat, and thank you for all who have made this very interactive. It's very nice. Uh, David, if I could ask you, we need to move on because of the time, but if I could ask you to have a look at the chat and where possible answer. And uh, now I would like to invite Jaime. Thank you, David, once again. I would like to invite Jaime Echeverria from EAE Consult in Costa Rica. Jaime is going to talk to uh, uh, us about ecosystem services, economic valuation, and the Minamata Convention. But before I pass it to Jaime, I would like to note that Jaime is one of the pioneers in the use of ecosystem service valuation in Costa Rica, having a long history of supporting the government and other organizations to develop market and policy incentives to support sustainable development. Uh, Jaime has very recently joined the Minamata family working on Mercury, and he's currently uh, working on a report for us as a consultant on the linkages between Mercury and ecosystem services and their valuation. Jaime, the floor is yours. Thank you. <laughs> 
Thank you very much, Manuela. And let me uh, let me share my uh, presentation, please. Is it okay now? It is, Jaime. Please. Okay. Go thank ahead. you very much. And I would like to talk a little bit about the economics of mercury. Uh, why is it important to talk about the economics? Um, well, there are many reasons, but uh, one of the most important ones is that we, uh, when we try to convey a message to policymakers, many times we're dealing with budgets, we're dealing with uh, with the uh, financial resources, and it is very important to to be able to make a case beyond the biological aspects, beyond the the very very technical aspects, and try to translate it into economic uh, information that can be uh, used by um, by different people for example I, I like to to put an example about the uh, climate change convention the climate change convention has made lots of progress in analyzing the economic aspects of climate change and for that reason they have been able to uh, raise support raise awareness in many instances. So uh, in this uh, situation, I like to uh, talk a little bit about the ecosystem services, but not just the services, but the economic value of those services. And as, as I said before, it is important that we measure economically the value of those. How much is a, a, a volcano? How much is an intact uh, forest? Uh, wetlands, oceans, coasts, all those have an intrinsic and many times large economic value. And I, uh, today, I would like uh, uh, to um, show you one way of grouping or uh, putting together in classes or types the different uh, services that exist. Um, let me say first that uh, organizations like the UN, the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, and other organizations have, have worked out different classification systems. And this is a combination of several uh, different systems that exist. I'm just trying to give you a general idea about those uh, services. In general, we can talk about the provisioning services, uh, such as water, food, genetic resources. And I think that Eva mentioned a lot of those, especially in the context of the Arctic, where we get the um, concentrations of, of mercury. I think she mentioned uh, things related to food, related to other um, inputs that are used by, uh, by, by people. Then ecosystems are also good at regulating different aspects of, uh, of, the, of the planet. Air quality, the climate, they regulate water, they reduce erosion. They also have important effects over disease and pests. In general, ecosystems play a very important role in regulating all of these natural processes. So we mentioned provisioning, we mentioned regulating, but we also get cultural aspects related to tourism, to recreation, spiritual, uh, social relations, sense of place. There are many, many aspects related to culture when we talk about ecosystems. And then we also have supporting services. Those supporting services are those that generate other services or that make other services uh, possible, like soil formation, nutrient cycling, primary production. And let me just mention that I, I, I don't think one class is more important than the other. All four classes are strictly necessary for our uh, survival. Um, that, that's a, yes, I just wanted to illustrate an ecosystem 
Uh, and just by taking a look at that, we see that there are important uh, features here. We see there is a, there is a, there are a low hanging clouds there. We see there's also that the forest is protecting the soil. We see a, a steep hills that uh, without the ecosystem will probably generate much more erosion, will not get or will not produce uh, water. Uh, a friend of mine calls this the, the water factory. I, I don't necessarily agree a hundred percent with that, but I think it is a it is a nice way uh, to put it to look at the forest as our water factory. Now, when we talk about of and I apologize for the drawing. This is a, a, my daughter's a, a creation, but I think it is very very important to take a look at the ecosystem in the same way that we look at all kinds of capital. When we look at capital, when we look at bonds and stocks, these are uh, generating benefits for society throughout the year. In fact, throughout the whole history of the world and throughout our lives. And I think this illustrates that the ecosystem will produce uh, benefits every single day, every single minute, every second of the day, it is generating benefits for us, for society, in the same way that the artificial capital will uh, generate benefits. So we have artificial capital on one side that is generating benefits to society, but we also have the natural capital, which is a necessary requirement for any kind of uh, development or any kind of well-being that uh, we like to, to get. I'm not gonna uh, go into a lot of detail here. I think uh, that Eva and David have uh, uh, conveyed the, the, the message and I like to talk about the economics, but there are so a couple of things that I like to highlight. For example, the imp Mercury's impact is not always clear cut. For example, reading some of the papers it says it may potentially compromise relative individual health and productivity. So this means that in there is a huge uh, space to uh, do a more specific research where we really, at the end, we don't talk about may potentially compromise, but we are a little bit more assertive. Eva mentioned the food provision and its importance uh, for local communities that base their diet on marine, freshwater, and terrestrial species. It is also very important to mention and in some sites and national parks are very important and damage uh, with mercury can um, disable those places for the natural enjoyment of the people. Now you say, okay, so how, how is it that we're gonna economically value uh, the damages from, from mercury? And there are, there are a few categories, of, and I have to apologize because this is the, the train, and I'm just gonna uh, be quiet for 10 se seconds. We have different uh, methods for evaluating uh, the economic value of the ecosystem services that I mentioned. We can use, and I'm not going to go into detail, uh, uh, you can find this in, in many places, and I also be willing uh, to answer questions. Uh, but for example, let's say, uh, let's get one, one example. We can use prices from similar markets. We can use directly observed values. For instance, in the communities that wildlife is traded uh, legally, I mean, uh, we can directly observe the value of those uh, transactions, or we can look at values from similar markets. For example, if we're talking about water, well, we can, we can use proxies for water from different sources, or if we're talking about uh, um, wood from the forest. We can also look at things that play the same role 
and are used for different things. Uh, but I like to point uh, here to, to these two. First, the travel cost method. That um, method uses the travel expenditures of people that may want to go to uh, visit a place. So by estimating the costs of those trips, we may get an insight on the true value of the ecosystem. There are also methods like the hedonic pricing method, and that one's very good because that method looks at the prices of the properties and relates it to the features, to the environmental and ecological features of such property. So by looking at differences in price, we may estimate what the economic impact of pollution, mercury included, can have over those properties. Uh, David, a little while ago, talked about the, I think he was talking about the replacement cost. The replacement cost is precisely what the cost is to undo the damage or to bring the ecosystem to its original state. As seen here, then there is a variety of methods that can be used to infer the economic value of the ecosystem services, even when those services are not uh, traded in markets. Now, going into, and this is an example from, from Wang et al. This is a very interesting model that they use to measure um, the impact of pollution of a river uh, in Europe related to the uh, contamination of that river. And let me, let me, this is just a, an example. I, I just wanted to show you, but uh, that case was very intensive in, in, uh, in data. They, were, they had the benefit of studying a river in Europe where they had many, many years of data, many, many years of information, which uh, I must say is not usually available in the, developing countries. So we uh, found that there are lots of, 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 of challenges and data gaps if we want to really measure the economic impact of mercury on ecosystems. As Eva mentioned uh, at the beginning, there are lots of examples when uh, health is the issue. So a lot of studies have focused on health. But if we want to take a look at the ecosystems uh, part, there are challenges such as mobility. Mobility, I mean the capacity of mercury to move around. Then there we have very, very little in terms of dose and response. We have examples for a few species, for a few classes, for very, very specific cases, but we don't do not have a complete a picture of how different doses will have different responses on different ecosystems. Then we have the problem of attribution. And a little while ago, someone mentioned, or someone, someone had a question about that. How can we isolate the effects of mercury versus other effects? Effects of oil pollutants, of pops, or any other. Then we have the problem of the time scale, as, uh, as presented by, by the colleagues a little while ago. Uh, mercury happens over long periods of time. And so, in many cases, uh, even the projects or the people who are studying it, they don't have the same time scale. So projects get finished, studies are, are done, only taking into consideration a small part. Uh, then another important difference here is that the measures of ecosystem services that are found on the literature 
I usually done on a per unit of area basis. So let's say, for example, Costanza, one of the most important uh, papers on ecosystem evaluation, all of their values are related to area and not to a singular species. And then we also have a lack of indicators for the social aspects of uh, pollution. In terms of the future, on what is a, a, a recommended or needed, I think that we can have three big uh, areas. One is research, where we should uh, carry out creative valuation examples. By creative, I mean studies that use hopefully available information that can be put into an economic uh, framework to inform uh, different people, then I th think that the, maybe the most important uh, research will be on cost effectiveness of different alternatives to mercury. Because as soon as there are cost effective alternatives, then there will be a an automatic shift away uh, from mercury, but as long as we have alternatives. Um, then in terms of awareness, I believe it is very important to not only carry out, but to use existing economic studies to uh, show and to educate everybody who is related to the convention. Uh, even if the studies are not directly linked to mercury. I think it will be very important to strengthen capacities, to include this information into national action plans. And at the, at the implementation level, as I said before, carry out the economical uh, analysis of alternatives, use pilots and extrapolate studies. As I said before, in the developing world, there is very, very little information. And so I think the extrapolation of other studies uh, may be very, very useful to raise awareness, to inform politicians, and not just politicians, also the people who are uh, um, invested into the convention. Um, I will uh, repeat a little bit. I will replicate studies. I will increase efforts in developing countries. I will very much focus on the cost efficiency of alternatives, focus on the total value of ecosystems. And from a research point of view, the biggest challenge is to untangle the effects of mercury from other stressors to the ecosystem. So I will leave it right there. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Jaime. Very interesting. Some challenges ahead for sure, but uh, extremely interesting. I wonder if anyone has any questions. And in the meantime, I also thank Zuleika and Gosia who have contributed to the discussions. I see that they've answered with providing some links and materials. That's very nice. And also to David for answering other questions. Um, are there any questions for Jaime? Um, Jaime, in your, it's, it's, it's uh, ecosystem service valuation is something that's evolving quite rapidly. In your opinion, is it uh, at least for other chemicals, not necessarily um, mercury, but uh, do you see, uh, uh, do you have, it's almost a guess, I, I understand that, but would you venture to say a time span when you think that this can be evaluated at least for market values? Uh, so, sorry, I didn't get the, the question, Manuela. Do you, do, would you venture to have an estimate of how long it will take until uh, scientists and policymakers can take the value of chemicals, particular chemicals, on ecosystem services? As I said before, the linkages are quite complicated. The, the science, sometimes you study a, a little species and that takes forever and not just time-wise, but also money-wise. 
So I think that in terms of the economic valuation, we have to be very strategic, not to in, in, engage or, or to embark on very costly uh, uh, research. But I think that, and I put the Costanza's paper as an example, that paper is very, very, it's at the aggregate level. So I believe that in terms of the people who are involved uh, today uh, in trying to get rid of mercury and mercury pollution on ecosystems, I will say those studies are good enough. I don't want to go to the, all the minute detail and spend a lot of money and then at the end have a, an estimate that is 10% different from the one I had at the very beginning. So I will just take into, uh, I will just try to promote, to disseminate uh, studies that already exist, measuring different ecosystem services in different places, because we have, we have such studies for North America, for Asia, Africa, Europe, the, the whole world, uh, we have examples. So I will more focus on those examples and try to extrapolate to Mercury uh, rather than engage into very, very detailed analysis because the combinations are infinite. If you combine it, ecosystem type with species, with e economics, then you, know, you have a, 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 an exponential uh, situation where you have an infinite uh, possible combinations. So say focus on those that are big, focus on those that are juicy, and focus on those that are already there and not very expensive. Very, very good comments. Thank you, Jaime. Very interesting. I will Thank also you. be discussing a little bit about ecosystem services in my presentation now. But before I do so, let me ask Kevin. I see that you, Kevin Bishop, I see that you have your hand raised. I don't know if you want to take the floor. No, you lowered your hand. I see that you had asked the question in the chat and that David answered. So that was probably it. So now let's move to my presentation. I will be speaking of something that's very exploratory. It's, um, let me just share my screen. I hope you can see it. So, I'm going to be talking about um, taking everything that we heard today from David, from Eva and Jaime and take it even a step further. Is how do we integrate all these, this information that's emerging, information that we already have into uh, policy making. And the question, the title of my presentation is whether natural capital accounting can support the implementation of the Minamata Convention. Keep in mind, please, that this is a very, very exploratory. So I will, as you will see throughout my presentation, I'll have more questions than, than answers, actually. Um, and it always started with, um, hold on, let me just, uh, here. It always started with a question that's been um, nagging me since I joined the Minamata Convention Secretariat over a year ago which is what is the total cost of mercury pollution? And I'm well aware that no one has the answer to this question, but I wanted anyways to explore. Um, of course, I started by doing a literature search and I ended up with hundreds of uh, articles. And uh, this first of high variability, but also the, the costs were generally only linked to human health and within human health, very specific to loss of IQ and uh, to remediation costs. With, um, so without any doubt, the best uh, categorized cost of mercury pollution is due to forfeit benefits due to the reduction of IQ. Um, from methyl mercury, per, and this has been estimated that per year the cost is of 8.7 billion US dollars, and those are in values of 2000. This is a it's a milestone paper that was published by Trazanda in 2005. There have been other studies. This is just a sample in Greenland that over 59 million dollars are lost per year, and in the European Union. 
this would go from eight to nine billion uh, euros in losses due to IQ reduction. So these are losses due to productivity. Uh, it's a very narrow uh, way of calculating loss, but the costs are already staggering. These calculations do not include less tangible costs of neurotoxicity, such as the cost of caring for someone who is uh, uh, impaired because of mercury uh, poisoning. It does not uh, evaluate the cost of the pain of a father and a mother who have a child who has been uh, who, who suffers from um, mercury poisoning. It also doesn't um, evaluate the many other diverse effects of mercury pollution that we've heard already from the previous uh, three speakers. What is interesting also is that we see that um, the costs are quite high. This is a it's a study also conducted by Trazand, but David who presented earlier today was also one of the co-authors. This was published in 2016, showing that in developing countries, the costs are also very high. These are two selected communities. And one interesting thing is that even in, in a place where there is no direct source of mercury, which was in, in the Cook Islands, in, the, in a village in Rarotonga, the global deposition of mercury also causes significant financial loss and, of course, health impacts. So, I, because this calculation from Trazant, the, the milestone paper that I mentioned from 2005, is related to the loss of productivity, I first had, was interested in knowing how would that translate into today's dollars amount of value. Um, to do so, I made a very simple calculation and uh, I came that th this, the amount that Trazand uh, calculated was equivalent to 0.076% of the US GDP for the year. So, in today's numbers of dollars, this would come to $13.70 billion. It's quite significant. And remember, this is from loss of productivity, so directly linked to the GDP. So, to take one step further, I was curious to see, because that loss is through dietary consumption of fish, I was curious to look at what would, could we extrapolate roughly, in a very rough manner, what would be the cost for other countries that eat an equal or more amount of fish per, per year, per person per year? So, by doing that, I had a list of countries that, that consumed, that the, the per capita consumption of fish was bigger than the U.S. And I took that percentage of the U.S. GDP and I applied to the GDP of those countries. So here you can see the US GDP plus more than three times the amount from other 61 countries who eat more fish, basically. Uh, this comes to 50, almost 51 billion in, in 61 countries, and this is in relation to the, to the GDP in 2020. Just to put this in a global context, the global wheat trade equals to 39 0.6 billion dollars. It's less than the amount of dollars lost to mercury. Um, gold is much more, of course, but the, the 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 money, the value lost due to mercury, uh, would account to more than 10% of the global uh, gold trade. And seafood would be about the mercury loss would be about one third of the total seafood trade. So, then come, came my second question. Um, I wasn't any closer to calculating the total loss of the total cost of mercury pollution, but I was wondering why isn't the cost of mercury part of national accounting systems? We already heard a little bit from Jaime about the challenges, but still, I wanted to see it's uh, it's significant the loss. We know in Europe, for example, that 62% of the water uh, bodies are not they don't reach a good chemical status. We know that water bodies 
including mangroves, but also uh, coastal uh, ecosystems such as coral reefs, they have the highest uh, total ecosystem service uh, value. These are very valuable uh, uh, ecosystems, not only in terms of uh, uh, market value, of course, but also in terms of regulatory systems, they regulate uh, biodiversity. Without these systems, there is a cascade of effects of secondary impacts that will lead to biodiversity loss, uh, uh, higher, uh, uh, more severe climate change effects, uh, less flood control, and so on and so forth. Water purification, there is a number of systems that go downstream from the from the aquatic ecosystems. So, more and more, it was more compelling to me that countries should start looking at mercury pollution more seriously and having uh, some making more efforts to, to calculate the total cost. So, why is this bridge still broken between science and policy? Uh, we know that relative to humans, the effects of mercury on wildlife and ecosystems are poorly understood. The economic value of reducing mercury pollution has seldom been quantified for wildlife and ecosystem functioning. Including the effects of mercury on wildlife and ecosystems is a daunting task. Those studies that exclude such benefits will underestimate the full benefits of mercury redu reduction. So it's clear that we need Policymakers need that information. Um, so here we have an uh, emission to impact pathway of mercury pollution. We have the domain, which is when mercury is still not in the environment, and here when it's mainly already in the environment. When we start from the primary mining or recycling, recycled mercury, we go through industrial processes. This is basically the life cycle of mercury. Uh, we go through the industrial processes, uh, artisan and small scale gold mining, mercury use, and then there's the emissions and releases. You all know this, this uh, uh, impact pathway, the environmental then distribution and fate of mercury. It's here that we start seeing the impacts. We see the effects on health, which are relatively well characterized in comparison to other impacts. Um, and at, at this level here, we know even less. The disturbance of earth system processes is still fairly unknown. So when we calculate, so our state of knowledge has focused very much so in these four first boxes. So we have some good evidence of uh, health impacts here and some in, in, in impacting on individuals, but we don't know much in terms of populations and biodiversity at large much less how these will impact climate change, will, how it will um, uh, in, uh, create synergies and the confounding effects with other chemicals and so on and so forth. So, however, this is changing. These, there are some very recent papers that started looking at this, which is quite promising. It's, uh, there are, this is a, a a recent paper looking at the effects of ocean warming, overfishing, and mercury on European fisheries. And um, it's uh, they, they, they used ecosystem and, and food webs modeling experiments that explore the impact of mercury pollution on uh, and overfishing and uh, climate. They came to conclusions that it will impact, on, there will be an impact on fish stocks. The health of ecosystems will suffer. There will be loss on fishes revenues, loss of social economic benefits, such as food and nutritional security of people. And it will have larger systems effects on the resilience of fish stock and marine ecosystems. So for the, it's one of the pioneer um, articles in modeling at the larger scale of uh, environmental uh, interconnections. Now, this is another uh, article that was published only a few weeks ago, some weeks ago, on the feedback of economic impacts of mercury on the economic system. So, they were looping mercury to 
to loss to to the ecosystem services that Jaime was talking to us on air, water, and soil to the uh, impacts on bio uh, on wildlife and biodiversity loss. Then cycling back to the ecosystem level, uh, to the economic level. Excuse me. So it's a it's a complex um, scheme. But what's important here to show is that they, the the authors grouped the effects mostly on two main uh, branches. One is biodiversity loss, and the other one is due to dietary intake. So the the loss of related to human health impacts. So this part here is what we know better. The biodiversity loss is what we know less. But just to echo what Jaime said, with what we have, it is already possible to do some calculations that may not be perfect, but may very well inform policymakers. Uh, the authors of this paper also concluded on existing gaps with regards to human health impacts is the accuracy of uh, the assessment, the influence of uh, mercury related health impacts on labor forces, and the feedback of labor forces changes to the primary inputs of the economic system. Because this again, this is the, that loss of productivity that I spoke about at the beginning of my presentation. Then on this other branch of um, uh, impacts, which start with biodiversity loss, the, the authors characterize the gaps on ecosystem impacts to the uh, accurate evaluation of uh, mercury related ecosystem impacts. So this is future work that's needed. The influence of mercury related ecosystem impacts on ecosystem services. So how do the impacts translate into the actual services that are delivered by nature? And the feedback of ecosystem service changes on the, on the economic system. So how will those changes really translate into um, monetary and non-monetary values. So with all that, instead of answering my second question, why mercury, why isn't the cost of mercury part of natural national accounting systems, I actually came with a third question, which was, can a natural capital accounting support the implementation of the Minamata Convention? This led us to start a very exploratory study together with a, a company called Wolf's company, and uh, which this is all they do. They, they calculate the value of ecosystem services and how to integrate that to a policy level. The, the studies is still a draft. We're still going through revisions and um, uh, redrafting, but this is uh, the title that you see, the socioeconomic impacts of mercury pollution on fisheries and livelihoods, exploring how a natural capital approach may support the implementation of the Minamata Convention. We used fisheries and livelihoods because this is where we see the most direct um, impacts, both on health and uh, socioeconomics uh, and livelihoods. We've seen, we looked at the commercial and artisanal fisheries. We looked at the impact because of uh, food advisories because of uh, changes in in the trade we looked at artisanal fisheries and the impacts on on local communities so we, in terms of ecological impacts dave has already spoken about this but at the physiological level there's changing behavior reproduction growth and survival of fish at the population level there's potential changes on food web dominance of species with higher tolerance to mercury and so on. One of the things that is plausible is that the top predators, which are, are those that accumulate most mercury, will be the ones that suffer the most. And those are also keystone species because they're very important in the food web to keep the balance uh, among other species. And uh, David also spoke a little bit about the linkages with other stresses. We know that the that climate change has a feedback loop with uh, mercury pollution, and that uh, it will exacerbate the effects and the, the availability of mercury in the environment. But this is also what we were particularly interested was the socioeconomic impacts. 
um, found that there are changes in, it causes change in consumer behavior. Eva explained that very nicely for the Inuit populations in Canada. It causes food insecurity and malnutrition. She also mentioned this. Loss of market value for commercial fisheries. Because of uh, food advisories in, in Europe, for example, um, they have to, uh, the mercury content is, is measured before uh, any fish can be imported into Europe. The loss of livelihood. A uh, large number of uh, communities, especially on coastal communities, they, they uh, well, not only, uh, in many communities, but they, they rely uh, on ecotourism. And uh, there is a study in Palau, for example, that showed that uh, a live shark will, through its lifetime, bring to, to the economy of the country $1.9 million, uh, a live reef shark through ecotourism. Um, whereas a, a shark that's dead and sold in the market will only bring a couple of hundred dollars. So for for local livelihoods, ecotourism is sometimes the only source of income. There is also um, uh, artisanal fishermen who sell their they, they don't fish only for subsistence, but they also sell their surplus at the local market in order to buy other things. And uh, this is what we see a lot in the Amazon, for example, in the Amazon region that fish that are caught in the rivers near uh, artisan and small scale gold mining, they are contaminated with high levels of mercury. And uh, because of the advisories, those fish are becoming less and less sought after for by the populations. So there is also the the erosion of culture and traditional values that Eva spoke about, especially for indigenous communities that rely, for example, in the in the consumption of uh, marine mammals and other uh, traditional food for their diet. So, looking at the natural capital approach, what it does for those who are not familiar, natural capital is the recognition that nature provides a set of assets. And these are not only the living things that nature provides, but also the air, the water, the soil, and so on. Anything that nature, nature provides from which there is an economic value, either direct or indirect, and by that I, I mentioned not only market value, but also the value, the, the cultural value, the spiritual value of assets. Everything is part of uh, this natural capital approach, which together with human capital, social capital, physical capital and financial capital form a, a, a complex of uh, uh, capital assets from which uh, countries can generate income flows. So natural capital accounting takes uh, into account the national, the natural assets. And it also recognizes that natural assets are not infinite. There is a flow, there is a usage, it, and this is very important, is uh, until maybe 50 years ago, um, First, there was no value given to to the goods provided by nature, but also there was this uh, notion that they were more or less infinite. Now we know very well with biodiversity loss that this is not the case. So natural capital accounting is a method to, of assessing the contributions of natural ecosystems to the economy in a way that's consistent with existing standards for system of national accounts used to measure economic activity. What it means is that national capital, natural capital accounting incorporates that fifth dimension of natural capital into existing national accounting systems. And why is this done? This is it, because it helps government to understand the economy's reliance upon natural systems. It tracks natural it tracks changes in natural systems that may have implications for different industries. It also helps manage natural resources and ecosystems to sustain the economic benefit into the future. This is the notion of the sustainability of uh, that these natural assets are not infinite. There is a, 
So over the past several decades, the UN, the United Nations and partner organizations have developed a standard framework for natural capital accounting that's called the System for Environmental Economic Accounting or SEER. -E there is most countries in 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 the northern hemisphere have already done some level of uh, development of their SEER accounts. In Europe, this is highly developed as well as in Canada. Um, but also countries in the southern hemisphere are catching up and many countries are interested in developing their accounts. So again, these are accounts that, that take into consideration the natural assets and the flow of uh, ecosystem services. So seeing this from a different perspective, if we see what a forest and, and Jaime was talking about the factories of water, but uh, it has also other functions. It's uh, you, the system first looks at the, the extent of the forest to describe that forest, but then the con in terms of geographic location characteristics and so on. But then it looks also at its condition, and here is where pollutants come. We can look at the 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 detrimental effects of pollutants and other drivers of degradation at this level here. Then how that impacts the, the services and goods that that ecosystem provides. Uh, in this example, water filtration, the, the result is clean water and these, the, the final beneficiaries are people. If we translate this into mercury, for example, and again, looking at fisheries, because that was what we were looking in our study, we see that the asset is fish, seafood and marine mammals. We see that the condition are the, total, the levels of total mercury and especially methyl mercury. The service here, in our example only, is the provision of food. Um, the benefit is food security, nutrition, local livelihoods and commercial fisheries. There may be others. And finally, the beneficiary are again the people. So, are there examples of uh, national cap natural capital accounting in Mercury? Yes, the answer is yes already. There are countries that are using this. The World Bank has used this for, for, for some years already in different countries. This here, this, this example, the first one is in Colombia. And uh, this here, if I'm not mistaken, this is in I forget this one, sorry, but it's some, it's one country in Europe and the other countries in Europe that are using, uh, not to the extent that I would like to see, that's not mainstream yet, but these examples show that this is possible and there are ways to calculate the contribution or the detriment of mercury pollution to the, to the ecosystem services. So one very exciting thing is that last year, the SIA ecosystem accounting framework was adopted. This is uh, with by that a, a set of internationally agreed statistical standards were uh, agreed upon many countries by the Statistical Com uh, Commission of the UN. And those standards are now in place for countries who wish to use them. What it does, it divides the the SIA ecosystem account into five core accounts. One is the ecosystem extent. It describes um, these, these uh, accounts, such as your, your bank account. This is all translated into numbers. These accounts measure over time the, the area, and it can be at nation, national level, but it can be, and very often is, subnational level, and even based on a river basin, for example, a protected area. And this becomes important when we look at David's uh, sensitivity areas or those threat, the high threat uh, areas. He showed the example, for example, from Gabon, that only a specific area within Gabon was more relevant. So this might be interesting to select those areas. The ecosystem condition, as I mentioned before, accounts the condition of ecosystem assets in terms of selected characteristics of specific points in time. Mercury concentration, for example, this is where the mercury concentration would be accounted for. Over time, it can record changes to their condition, provide valuable information on the health of ecosystems. 
So the monitoring efforts under the Minamata Convention can contribute quite significantly to this part here. Um, they, these two record ecosystem services, both in terms of um, physical accounts as well as monetary accounts. So when there is a dollar value, they would be come here, but the physical accounts are also extremely important for the non-monetary values. And then finally, the monetary ecosystem asset accounts records information stocks and changes in stock. This is also very important. It's that idea that the stocks, which are the natural assets, they're not infinite. And it helps plan and uh, better manage nat the natural resources. So. Uh, I won't go into detail here. This is all very small. It's just to show that these uh, standards that were adopted, they they include, for example, several things that are relevant to mercury. Uh, to fish, for example, it it records it offers a method to record fish um, in terms of uh, size, age, health. It also includes heavy metals. So the pressures, the flows to the environment of heavy metals is already foreseen in this framework. And uh, this all links together with the ocean economy. In this case, again, I'm using ocean because of our example in fish, but there is also air accounts. Uh, there is uh, water more generally, not just for ocean, but also for inland water that look all the same. Um, so it looks into the ocean economy and governance uh, and how much that uh, that uh, by combining the, the quality of the ecosystem with the pressures and this the services that it provides how much it contributes to the economy and it can compare how governance uh, measures are contributing to to maintaining or even to depleting even more the assets so finally this is i believe my last slide this is back to our study. It's uh, it's just a snapshot of now moving away from fisheries only, but looking at mercury more uh, globally, how they impact drivers, which are inputs to or outputs from economic activities, which can affect nature. What are the impact drivers in the, in the case of mercury? We have ASGM coming at top, co-burning, non-ferrous metal production, cement production, and as well as other processes and uses, of course. Drivers of environmental change, uh, the drivers of uh, that are natural and man-made pressures that can affect natural capital assets and their ability to continue providing goods and services. In the case of the Minamata, of course, we are only looking at man-made pressures, and these are pollution by accumulation and by magnification of mercury population changes, and in this case, I'm talking about animal populations and habitat modification. Again, talking about biodiversity. The natural capital assets, in the case of mercury, we can think of uh, fish and seafood, sea mammals, coral. The habitats are also assets, water and sediments. As I mentioned, the assets are both living and not living. Um, the ecosystem services that they provide, they provide food, biodiversity, livelihoods, water quality, cultural values, recreation, and many more. And with that, I believe, I come to the end of my presentation and um, I thank you and I will take any questions that you may have. Just trying to stop here my presentation. So. Would anyone have any questions? Let me try to see here the the chat. Um, sorry, I wasn't following it, so give me just one second. There is a, a, a comment here from Li Fei Zhang, about fish consumption for each country are very different from for each other. Meanwhile, the uh, mercury content in fish for, of each country are different too, absolutely. And the values are also not the same as US. 
NCAs are different in different countries. Uh, for example, a river flow across several countries and the value of the same river depends on the country's development stage. The cost of mercury pollution are very complex. I could not agree more with you, Lipe. This is absolutely true. Um, that uh, rough calculation that I showed showing different uh, uh, countries is absolutely a rough estimate, extremely rough. It's only to to have an idea of the dimension and again it would be a very limited uh, scope. The, the river that flows through several countries is a very important also in terms of uh, transboundary uh, environmental issues and uh, how to deal with that. Thank you for your comment. Um, see uh, the Someone supporting that the Minamata Convention may benefit from natural capital accounting. I'm happy to hear that, Jaime. Um, and uh, that we could focus on those keystone species to extrapolate the results. Uh, yes, it's all very... Um, yes, I see also a comment from Sujiwa on indigenous medicine uses in mercury and preparation of their medicine, Sri Lanka has started a research on scientific analysis of this. Yes, this, this can all provide very uh, useful insights in those, for example, if Sri Lanka were to include mercury into their nat natural capital accounting, that could be a value that would be included in the accounting. Uh, I wanted to also mention that uh, because at the beginning of the webinar today, I mentioned the global biodiversity framework. There is a, uh, there are several accounting systems that will be used as monitoring or will most likely be used. The, the, the framework has not been adopted yet, but some of the indicators rely on the SIA ecosystem accounting. Uh, framework. And this is interesting because one of the accounts is air quality. And uh, so there is a, a information from Mercury that's already readily available on levels of, uh, of uh, Mercury in the air. So this is the indicator is to, to measure not Mercury alone, but pollutants in the air. So this this could be something that where the Minamata Convention could contribute already. And benefit from then the, the, that type of information being integrated into larger accounting systems. So um, if there are no more comments, I would like to, I'm just checking again the, the chats, the chat. No, I don't think there are any more. If there are, we'll check later if I missed something, but I would like to thank all um, Presenters today, if you wish to switch on your camera again, just to say. Uh, and uh, Isaku, I don't know if you want to wrap up with something. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, Manuela. And, and yeah, we, we, we have seven minutes, and, and uh, I, I chatted to, to the panelists, but, but I, I think your, uh, Manuela, your, your, your questions are very, very, very uh productive and 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 pro provoking i think i think and and i would be uh very interested to 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 to, to see how dave and jaime uh, would comment on the questions that uh, uh manuela posed and and tried to 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 respond so i uh uh if, if we could spend spend the remaining time for that it would be great so can can we uh Start with uh, Dave. Sure, sure, Sako. Um, I guess I, I draw my experience uh, with the Natural Resource Damage Assessment, um, so NERDA in the U.S., the United States. It's a regulatory sort of um, approach to uh, quantifying injury from contaminants. They could be from mercury or oil spills or chemical contaminants, and by quantifying that injury through biota, um, it's a very quantitative way, and it's, a, it's an approach that also includes um, a governmental and a stakeholder um, group, and then industry. So it's an industry governmental sort of approach to quantifying potential injury with other stakeholders involved if needed. 
And, and I think the really important part of that is this, is this economic quantification in the end. And as I remember, as I mentioned before, um, again, there's a lot of money involved, so say with an oil spill, and there's a lot of examples now where if there is an impact on a, a whole suite of organisms within a system, the loss of those organisms can be added up as individuals. And those individuals can be recovered with management or conservation uh, approaches, such as just purchasing land that otherwise would have been developed. That purchase of that land, that cost, that, that cost can be related to bringing back a certain number of organisms that were lost. So it's a very, um, I think, elegant and simple approach from, from that standpoint. There's a lot of complexities in getting those quantitative numbers in a, in a way that is, is acceptable by all. But there's also a lot of examples in the US, and as far as I know, that regulatory sort of approach is somewhat unique in the world, and that might be a, a one good example to use as we move forward. Thank you, Dave. And Jaime? As I like to mention that, uh, yes, they, David is right in ter that the, the United States is very, very much ahead of the, of the rest of the world in that area, because not only uh, regarding environmental aspects, but injury in general uh, and environmental specifically. I think this all uh, started a little while ago with the Exxon Valdez uh, oil spill. And as David said, that was a lot of money, several billion dollars in, in damages. And I think that's a way to uh, promote or to direct the use uh, or the better use of resources and to get rid of substances uh, such as, as mercury. In terms of the natural capital approach, I think that uh, we need to favor simple uh, analysis, uh, like uh, some of the those presented by by Manuela, because those uh, simple analysis are I, I favor those much better. Uh, many times in the in the developing world, we don't have enough information. We don't have long time series of data, and the ones that we have are are sketchy in in many ways. So uh, the, the approach to a simpler methodologies is a little bit counterintuitive uh, for people who are engaged in academia or in, uh, in the sciences because the, complex, the more complex the model, uh, the more impressive it is and the more uh, uh, people uh, you know, will, will um, um, look up to that. But I say that an opposite approach is needed. Maybe get a few examples, simple examples, examples that make sense, that are very intuitive and that can be understood by anyone. I agree. And if I could just add to that, uh, one thing that I didn't mention is that there is a lot of controversy around valuing nature. There is a of course, there are the proponents of adding natural assets to accounting systems, but there is there are also this, the diverging views that think that these will only reinforce the notion that you can only protect what you can value, what you can put a dollar sign. And um, this is, of course, a, a consideration and how to, to value those intangible assets, such as cultural value, it's quite difficult. One way of, uh, in developed countries, it's perhaps a little easier because there is the willingness to pay for certain uh, recreation, for example. The, the fact that you go out and you enjoy a lake or you enjoy a walk on the forest. But how can someone who is barely able to survive and buy something to eat, uh, be part of that willingness to pay calculation. That is impossible for a developing country. Uh, on the other side, on the other hand, there's also those that say, uh, so far, nature value was effectively uh, deemed to be zero because they're not part of the accounting systems. So these are the two sides. Is it better to value some, to put a dollar sign in some of the assets 
while not being able to to evaluate those more complex assets that Jaime just mentioned, but at least have some simple uh, methodologies that that measure those more obvious ones, so that governments can be better informed and make better decisions on um, mercury reduction and uh, other measures. Um, it's it's an open debate. No one has the the answer. Uh, there are many views, but no one has the final answer, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Manuela. So now it's it's five o'clock, so it, it, it's time to close. I, 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 I like to, to say uh, a couple of thing, thing, things to, to close. One uh, is, is, is that uh, uh, we uh, uh, we acknowledge the, the support of, of the, the I, I think, I, if I'm not mistaken, it's the Swedish, Swedish government that, that provided funding for, for, for this study. We asked the Wolf's company to do, and, and also Jaime, to uh, uh, to, uh, to explore and and, uh, and the sec secondly, uh, we, our intention, uh, original intention was, was to to have, have this uh, meeting in in uh, the uh, the framework of the ICMGP itself, but but uh, uh, from what I understand, the in the ICMGP he originally. Uh, the, the socioeconomic impact was listed as, as one of the potential sessions, but, but I, I think my, my guess is that there the, the, the are not sufficient number of, 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 of submissions, abstracts for, for, for that ses session to, to, to be set up. So uh, we, we would uh, ex uh, ex expect uh, in, the, in the future, uh, the, the South Africa will, will host the, the the uh, the in-person ICMGP ICMGP meeting in 2024. So we we hope that the that there will be more socio-economic uh, researches uh, presented in the in the uh, mercury, mercury studies. And uh, lastly, uh, I would um, open this uh, uh, WebEx platform for 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 a couple of minutes uh, for th those of you. Who, uh, to 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 put anything in the chat box, uh, whether uh, about, a, a, anything uh, of, of what, what you learned or questions you 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 would like to 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 have uh, the the conversation secretary to to explore, explore and, and so on. So uh, this platform from will be open for for a while. So having said this, thank you very much for all the presenters, and and we look forward to to further. Uh, discussion on social social economic aspects. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.